Hey, George, so, um, oh wait, you're muted. <clears throat> That's no good, all right, here I am. Hey, so um, that link, do you, do you have to let people in? Yes. Yeah, okay, all right. Is there another way that most people go about that? Uh, well, just, I, I guess what it comes down to is sometimes they just get in, but maybe that's, it, you know, I think maybe it's just that with a passcode, it has to be run by you first. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I apologize for the frustrations around that. I, I mean, you know, what's funny is so Andy, you know, I, I after he mentioned that that link didn't work, I sent him the, the, the other link. And then he wrote back today and said that he wasn't sure if that one worked either. But I mean, it's just a link. I clicked it. It works. You know, right. I, right. You know, I, so um, so basically, I'm going to leave my phone on for the first few minutes, just in case we have anyone, you know, trying to get in who can't okay. make it. OK. Uh, well, we've got five people in the waiting room now, which is nice. And go. Uh, God will be back with us in a moment. Okay. Um, and you look like did I'm did you trick me here? Did you add a purple balloon to the to the stem? No, there's let's see. No, there's a, there's there's not a purple one. There is or this one over here is blue. Blue. I'm, blue. I'm doing this with my cursor. You can't see my cursor. No, I um, can't. Yeah. <laughs> That one is blue. All right. Here's one that's blue. Okay. Okay. Oh, I see. They they move around a little bit. It's sort of, you know, I I did crank the AC up. It got hot, so I cranked it up a little bit. So now it's a little more jittery. All right. Well, it is um, on, on the brink of admitting all. There's Ann Kendallin. That'll be nice to see her. That's great. And Joel. I mean, yeah. Feel free to let people in, and we can just, you know, have a trickle. Have a trickle. So, so my my beverage of the evening is a is a non-alcoholic uh, bubbly water uh, that has a little caffeine in it and some oh. blood orange and grapefruit. Wow, was that blood oh, comma orange? Is that what? Blood comma orange. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> blood and orange. <laughs> it's some orange blood we have going on there. <laughs> hey, there's all kinds of friends and friendly faces here. Hi. Hey, Stella. Hi, Ann. Hi, Joel. Good to see everyone. And we have two Stephanies. Boy, oh, okay. At least two Stephanies. Um, we have a few more people coming in. If I was really, if I was really slick, I'd, I'd develop a little, a little like set of trailers beforehand, you know, a slideshow that would give a little quiz, you know, which of these actors was in, you know. <laughs> um, and oh, it would have a sort of rousing uh, hip hop soundtrack. Oh, someone's, someone's bouncing a little bit. Um, letting some more people in. Um, if everyone could mute themselves, um, just at least for the for the first twenty minutes or so. Um, it is now six oh one. Um, so good evening. Uh, my name is George Slade. I'm the host of uh, Photo Book Banter, and I'm a writer and photographer based in Minnesota's Twin Cities. Um, this evening, the banter is with the inestimable Sean Records uh, of Portland, of the West Coast Portland, not the East Coast Portland. Um, and Sean has been a longtime resident of, of Portland, well, two decades almost, right? Almost, yeah. Um, previously from Idaho and Boise State University and Syracuse, New York, where he got his MFA. Um, I think a lot of you probably know uh, probably know Sean. Some of you don't know Sean, and I'm glad you're having a chance to meet him this evening. Um, 
I'm glad uh, to see many familiar faces, as I said. Um, Sean and I go back a few years uh, to the, I think the early days of Photo Lucida in Portland. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure for me to welcome someone who I, I, one of the things I like to do with these programs is to talk to people who I, who I know and people who have done a couple of books, um, people who are you know, fully immersed in the dialogue around photography. And I like to just banter. And to me, a banter is, is a kind of casual exchange between colleagues. Um, and so uh, let's admit some more people. I love that we're getting a good, a good turnout tonight. Um, hey, George, can I, can I interrupt and tell a story about turnout? Absolutely. Like while people are trickling in because about, this is about did you say turnips or turnout? <laughs> I hate turnips, <laughs> but I love I've got this great story about turnout because it, first off, thank thank you all of you for being here. And it's kind of exciting because I know some of you, I don't know some of you, but it's already wildly successful. Okay. <laughs> and and know that because I, I often play this game, you know, it's like, what's, what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, like I live most of my life there imagining that and then just everything's gravy on top of that. And I once um, was part of a panel discussion at a regional museum uh, and was super excited. You know, it was a long time ago and I felt really excited to be invited to be part of this panel. And it was like five hours from me. And so I drive there and I show up and it happens that this is in a museum that was where my parents lived. So like I got to see my folks, it was fun. And I show up at this panel discussion and there are three people in the crowd, me, one other photographer <laughs> and a curator. And, and there was like a hundred chairs set up oh, in this space, no. right? Like it was the, the saddest public event you've ever been to. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I thought, oh, thank God. Now we can just talk. We can banter, just like George is saying. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I sit down and I'm ready to banter. But to, but to my amazement, the other two on the stage with me just like pretended like it was legit and real. And we had an hour and a half long panel discussion for these three people in the crowd. Mm. And then at the end of the event, as painful as it was, like we all made it through, two of those three people were a couple sitting together and they approached me at the end of the event. And they said, oh, hey, that was really great. I really appreciate it. I was like, wow, thanks so much. You know, I really appreciate you being here. You know, are you fans of photography? Like, what's your deal? And the woman said, oh, no, 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 no. I, just, I work with your mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the way it goes, isn't it? Yeah. So um, this is wildly successful. Yeah, I know. You mentioned before that you'd be happy if one person showed up. Yeah. And, and for a exactly. while we had we had one person who showed up early and we were like, <laughs> okay, okay, we, we can count this as success. Yeah. Um so anyway, you've you've got a few books. Um and two of them in particular are are familiar and are sitting on the on the desk right next to me. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time, much of our time this evening, looking at the newest book, which is titled Hero, published by Ain't Bad earlier this year. Um, and uh, sorry, I get distracted by the chat room, and I better just close that down so I don't, I don't continue to get distracted. Um, but we're going to be talking about books that have covered a, a space of more than 10 years. Uh, if we go back to the, the the book about, well, that reflects the, I guess we'll call it the rupture in your family. Um, sure, sure. <laughs> you're okay using that word um, because it sounds like it was a really fascinating and dramatic point in your life. Um, and that that book, Owner of This World, is from 2007, right? Yeah. Um, but... Uh, Let's lead up to Hero by looking at some of the some of the earlier work. Although, do you want to first go through um, your your story and the and the the story from the newspaper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I would. Um, here, I'm going to share my screen. 
Yep, I gave you permission. It should work. There you go. All right, cool. Um, so uh, again, first off, just thanks everyone for being here. Super fun. Um, secondly, so George and I were talking about what to talk about, right? The pre-talk talk. And um, I mentioned that one of the things that still to this day really sort of informs my just my a whole approach to the way that I use photography is this newspaper clipping that I read in the newspaper on March 2nd of 2001. Okay, now if you don't believe me, um, you know, it just so happens like here we are, we're in my place, right? Like here's what's left of the original newspaper clipping. I've lost parts of it. I don't know where the hell it is. Um, but I did find a story online and I'm just gonna sort of read through the highlights of the story so you can sort of get a sense of how it relates, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the headline is, defendant calls acts a symbol, not a threat. Man who was shot by police says he wanted to draw attention to house next door. Frederick Jennis testified Thursday, he walked toward two armed city police officers clutching an ax in his hand as a symbol of justice and was stunned when he ended up being shot twice. I never wanted to hurt anybody that day, Jennis said as he told his story to an Onondaga County Court jury for about two and a half hours. Jennis, 41 of 104 Mooney Avenue admitted in court Thursday that he broke into the house next door to his residence, cut off the utilities, boarded up the doors, posted handmade condemnation signs, and told the residents they could not go back inside. <laughs> but he repeatedly maintained his actions were a protest stemming from decades of frustration about not getting police and city officials to deal with what he said were drug dealers and other lawbreakers living in the neighboring residence. I remember the whole day quite vividly, he said, noting he had begun planning his attack on the house next door about a month earlier. He said he carried it out on June 23rd because it was a Friday and the three month anniversary of his father's death. Jenis detailed how he broke into the house by using a sledgehammer to get through a locked side door. He then told how he shut off the electricity, gas and water and took the utility meters to his garage. Then he waited at the house for the neighbors to come home. Jenis said he heard police arrive and he headed out his back door to meet them. He said he carried the ax as a symbol of justice based on a dream he had a decade ago. It's the spiritual gift I was given. I don't look at it as an item or a weapon or anything, he said. He said he realized someone else might not see the ax in as benevolent a fashion as he did and kept it lowered at his side as he began walking toward officers Dwayne Rude and Jacqueline Finney in this driveway. Why? Harry asked, didn't Jenis drop the ax when the officers drew their guns and began yelling at him to drop the weapon. That day I was trying to stand up for justice, Jenis replied. I thought if I don't raise the ax, how can anybody interpret it as a threat? Jenis said his goal had been to get the police to respond so he could try to persuade them to do something about the house next door. Yet he admitted he never said a word as he walked toward the officers because he thought it was up to them to initiate conversation. Jenis denied ever raising the ax before he was shot. I saw the muzzle flash and I heard the big boom, he said. That first shot struck him in the upper right leg, whipped him around and knocked him flat on the ground, he testified. Jenis said he stood and picked up the ax again because something just kicked me in the butt and told him to stand up for what he thought was right. He said he raised the ax to about chest height before dropping it back to his side. That was when he was shot a second time in the lower abdomen, he testified, he said. Um, I can cut it there, but yeah. so the thing is, the, the reason this is relevant at all is because to my mind, that story is the way that I use photography, okay? Like you've got two differing realities going on in that story. And the important thing is they're super real to each different party involved, you know? To the police officers, the context around their lives, their job is one of a man carrying an ax and previous threats of violence. To him, Frederick Jennis, well, you know, he had a dream. 
And that dream told him to carry this symbol of justice. And everybody should be able to read that symbol of justice as a symbol of justice to him. Mm -hmm. um, the way that I use photography, and photography can be used in a lot of different ways, right? But the way that I've always only ever really cared about using it is to cling to reality, right? Like, and what I mean by that is my pictures are not, I don't use, I don't use super wide angle lenses. I don't use artificial lighting. I don't use techniques that draw attention to the way a photograph was made. I make photographs that are seemingly of the world, yet at the same time, hopefully, they also exist in another world right? Like this sort of trying to hit at the sweet spot where those two different realities are sort of butting up against one another and things can go either way. Well, and you're, you're making reference to what I think of as the extraordinary everyday or what you, what you I think, have come to embrace uh, in terms of the epic. Exactly. I was going to say, I, on that newsletter you sent out, I loved the phrase everyday epic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so there is a there is a sweet spot. It, there's also a sweet spot in making making books, isn't there? How you find a find a spot between the individual image and the image uh, of the book as a whole piece of sculpture. Absolutely, you know. yeah. Um, so, let's talk a little bit about about hero or start with owner of this world, if you if you like. Sure. I mean, you know, so. Oh, did you, owner, did you yeah, find that the blue sky book by the way i did i found the blue sky book i mean so okay. but i have but owner I have, is first i have previous books here but uh owner of this world and this is like this is a a weird loaded side tangent but in 2006 my son max played the character of max in the major motion picture version of Where the Wild Things Are, the Maurice Sendak book, right? Like it was this huge deal. And within my family, we call it the rupture because it kind of came out of nowhere and changed the course of everything for a while, right? Like, I mean, that said, so much is still the same. I still live in the same house, you know? Like everything is still the same for the most part. Um, but everything just kind of got thrown up and was up in the air for a while. So um, this and you know, give us. I mean, let's let's focus really carefully on on how that structure worked when you okay. discovered um, about the the. Uh, you just you take it from here. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, I mean, so the way that this book came about is. I think that the, the two main things that need to be known to set it up are simply that I started this book as a birthday present for myself when I turned 40, okay? That's, that's relevant because of course, 40 is the, the time in our lives when in a sense, I mean, you know, the midlife crisis jokes start coming in and you, I'd say culturally, you are no longer becoming, you have become. And your, your goal at 40 is to accept who you are and sort of, you know, deal with that. And so um, as I sort of hit that cultural landmark, like everyone, my first thought was like, oh, this is it? You know, like, oh, that, that's it. You know, this is what I got for it. Um, and I, like I say, as a gift to myself, I kind of thought like, well, what if I made my life more significant mm. through structure, you know, like a little revisionist history here. And so um, I had been, and I have two kids, by the way, and both of my children heavily, heavily, heavily influenced by, you know, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, uh, the, the Buddha series of graphic novels, like all of these books and movies, etc., that are built upon a hero's journey, this sort of classic literary structure that's been used time and time again. And 
and laid out by in the past, right? It's called basically sort of cultures from all over. And um, no doubt, he's so old. You know, they had them up with it. I didn't have to make it myself. It was, it was right there. It's mm -hmm. been used over and over and over again. So what I did was this um, table of contents right here. This is just completely ripped off right out of George uh, Joseph Campbell's book. Um, you know, that's Sean. That's, yeah, Sean, we're not seeing. I, I'm I'm seeing a cover of the Zoom post attendee page when you oh. share. Well, let's let's try that again. All right. Love that there you have it. There we go. Hello. How's that? That looks All great. Right. Now you actually took that typeface right from Joseph Campbell's book, didn't you? Yes and no. I'm going to go back. <laughs> um, yes uh, and no. The the I did actually. You know what? The typeface I didn't take exactly from him. The the title I sort of built myself, and then the table of contents. I think I took that from this old Chaucer book right oh. here. Um, there we go. But it's, but, but it's built. That's the structure of of Campbell's book. Exactly. And so, you know, there is there is nothing clever on my part here. It's a gimmick that I stole straight from other people, you know, and that was That's up. To, and to my mind, like that was part of the fun of mm -hmm. the whole thing is just like taking this structure and just sort of putting my own uh, contents into the template and building a life of more significant meaning. Just like that. It's just that easy. <laughs> Building a life of more significant meaning. Yeah. Can you just elaborate on that for a second? Well, I just mean that um, when all is said and done, my photographic life has oftentimes been minutia, the everyday, the, the, the common, you know, like this, this photograph right here of some random world headquarters of something you know with this newspaper out front i've made i at this point you know i spent the last 10 years at least digitally and anyway um making photographs of the every day and so uh by taking that template that structure i was trying to sort of tongue-in-cheek uh make it greater and more significant and and where does the axe fit in well, <laughs> so in terms of Frederick Janice and the Axe, I mean, you know, like ultimately that is all about that, that shift, that, that, that threshold, let's call it, between that world of reality and that world of metaphor, mm -hmm. right? And photography exists there. This photograph, for example, you know, is uh, at the very beginning, the crossing of the first threshold. I can tell you that that's, this section without looking it up because it's all about, or I'm sorry, this is the call to adventure, right? Before we cross the threshold, but it's all about that sort of other world. And, and the, the hero's journey as uh, Campbell has written about it is all about like escaping the known world and the boredom, monotony, et cetera, and transporting oneself to this other special world. Um, and so, in a sense, this book is all about just like letting the pictures create that fantasy world. You have you have so much wonderful faith in the in the photographs and in the language that they carry. Um, that's a that's a trust you've probably had to develop over over a long period of time. Tell me what you mean when you say faith. Well, in that in that you you allow photography's generosity as a medium of description to fill out our our windows. You know, sure. you 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 allow photography's willingness to concentrate on a little dog to draw our attention, you know, into into a tiny corner of a garage, you know, and, and realize that the whole space is also animated. Um, I mean, I, I just I like the fact that that you you respect photography's ability to delve into the detail. Well, I mean, yeah, like 
this whole book has simply been, in a sense, like it's a love letter to photography. Mm. Not about me. I mean, you know, like I'm the gimmick, the, the, but it, the glory of photography for me is just that photographs are so bad at meaning anything specific. And so you can put two different pictures together and, you know, meaning is a shapeshifter. Mm -hmm. And so we can kind of float around through different things. The only thing that makes any photograph in this book sort of lean toward this idea of an epic hero's journey is me saying so. Right. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> and, and you saying so as part of a, as part of the sequence of the book. I mean, I think that's the really remarkable part of you know, the one plus one equals five equation um, that sequencing uh, creates. Well, I mean, so one of the things that's kind of interesting, just like in terms of the way that my, my approach to photography has shifted over the years, is that one of the reasons that so many of these pictures didn't have homes, and I mentioned that I started shooting digitally in 2006, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, it took quite a while for me to take any of those pictures seriously because I had been shooting film. I had been shooting large and medium format film for so many years that digital pictures seemed like the throwaway pictures, the same way that people often think of their phone pictures right now, right? And um, it was liberating to sort of come back and look at them seriously and realize that in addition to all the other strategies that we can use photographically, we can simply use sequencing and also quantity. And when I say quantity, I mean, one of the goals with this book initially was to create like this huge epic tale. You know, the first few drafts of this book, well over a hundred photos. Mm -hmm. um, it's been sort of scaled down now. The, the book in hand is 69 pictures. Um, but it fun. took a while to cut it. Yeah, I was I was gonna I was gonna suggest that we oh there's your son, there's yes. Max. Um, I would like you to notice that his shirt says something like "fuck you, Soros," <laughs> which which was a which was a phrase right out of the uh, the the book, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, ha ha ha. No, what I was oh oh great, here comes the fireworks. Um, no, what I was gonna ask is is if you had. Um, yeah, boy, I love that sequence. Um, I was going to ask if you had your maquette, so to speak, um, your your box. Oh, of, because because this is how this book grew, as I understand it. Yeah. And, so and this book this book had a had a had a um, a genesis of about ten years. Yeah, yeah. Was, I mean, so it was, it was going to be your gift to yourself as a as turning forty. Exactly. And, and so um, that summer that I turned 40, what I did was I went, I'm going to, I'm going to exit out of the book for just a second. So I can just show you here. What I did is I went through the Campbell book and, and I like for the record, I'm no smarty pants academic. In fact, I get so bored and impatient with, uh, you know, this, the, the, the heft of his, so what I ended up doing was I would sort of wade my way through the book. And then eventually I would sort of find a single passage in each of his chapters about what the refusal of the call means, for example, or supernatural aid. And I plucked these passages out and I made little prints of them. And I've got a wall here in my shop that has the, the magnet paint on it. And I would just stick these up on the wall and then I went back through the archives of you know, my photographs. I'm gonna stop the share for a second just to emphasize. And I made just little tiny prints, okay? Little, little, little prints. And I made specifically, here's my ever safe first aid kit, junior achievement company box. And inside this box, Whoa. You can see that there are literally just hundreds mm. of little prints in here. And I had those passages up on the wall and I would just sort of play that game of read the passage, look through the photos. Part of it is just finding the pictures that are strong enough, you think, 
And I'd be the first to say there are, like, I'm open to the idea of using, I don't want to say weak, but sometimes you use pictures that aren't as strong to make your point within a right. sequence or sort of, you know, play. Like, ultimately, the goal was to serve the narrative arc right. while still maintaining a photo to photo picture flow throughout the whole right. thing. Well, you've said it, you said it has to work picture to picture. Yeah. Um, but that, that sequence of the fireworks, I think is, is quite intriguing because, because it does use multiple images that are maybe less overwhelming in themselves. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, you know, specifically with that. Okay. So it's just like in terms of the sections, right? Like playing between the book and the other, this is from the section, the section called atonement with the father. It's all about the hero sort of coming to terms with where they are from, who they are from, and sort of taking charge of their own lives, right? And if I look back at this time in my life, I mean, there's no more significant sort of play on that idea than my relationship with my eldest son at the time, you know? And so for me to use Max here in this case, and then go to this bruise, which was, you know, for the record, it's not in the photo, you don't know this, but I mean, that's my arm. And I used to regularly sort of play this game with Max, for example, where I would help him channel his anger by just saying, punch me, you know, punch me, punch me, punch me. In hindsight, I do not recommend that to any <laughs> parent out there, okay? Mm -hmm. I may have done so, that may have been a dumb move on my part, but still, uh, and then I loved just this diptych of, that punch, the fire, or the bruise and the fireworks, right? This explosion. Now, one thing that I especially loved about this little sequence, so we've got the fireworks, we've got the fade, boom. By the way, that particular photo sort of, that's a, a, a chapter that is just the one image, apotheosis right there. But I just wanna go back here. When I talk about the photos being from the everyday and there are some in here that are certainly a little more epic and you know special and fancy than others. But this photograph of the fireworks and these three photographs of the fireworks, those are not even the same year. And I did not know that until I had made the book. It was when I was gathering the files and editing the files for a final sort of you know editing pass through that I realized that even though it's made in the same spot, shot from my driveway, looking in exactly the same direction and framed by the same trees and the same little bit of horizon line down here at the bottom. Well, look at the tree here. I mean, this one is where the flash popped, but still, that's just a completely different year. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, photography is it, is it, I mean, I, sorry, I keep uh, harping on the, the ax, harping on the ax. Um, but when, when musicians talk about their guitars, they say, oh, you know, I got my axe, you got your axe with you, you know, and, and, yeah. and I think that certain photographers also refer to their equipment as an axe. So, well, I, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, I guess I don't think of my, I'd like to think of mine as a hug. Can I, can mine be a hug, George? A because hug? this photograph right here coming out of the, uh, you know, that little puff of smoke right mm -hmm. here in the sort of empty void of existential awareness. Um, this photograph to me reads as a hug. It is everyone's mother, right? It is this, this universal thing. And by the way, George, this is the one I made in Minnesota. Oh, yay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, well, you know what I see when I look at this picture? Yeah. I mean, I see the heart and I see the hug. But I also see like a stellar being, you know, this, 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 supernova kind of blast away of the head you know there, yeah. there's only there's only brain or there's only you know celestial matter remaining exactly but it's loving it is well, i guess um what else like it, it, where are we on time um well we're um at a place where people could start chiming in if they like um if you feel like Asking a question, you can take yourself off of mute um, and let I'll us know. I'll keep sort of flipping through, but yeah, I'm happy to, you know, 
Um, yeah, I mean, the, the first, well, I think let's just look at pictures. I think that's pretty great. Nothing speaks as well as images do. I mean, there's your axe. Yes. Do you suppose Mr. Jenis did some photography in the in his off hours? <laughs> he should. I mean, he's already like he's got a head start on it. I thought of it as kind of a massive rationalization, though. You know, and what and what photographer hasn't created a massive rationalization for their work at some point in time? <laughs> exactly, I hear you. Um, hey, so tell me, tell me about the process of of making this book. I mean, you've had several different experiences in the bookmaking world, and to sort of look at the details of uh, your publishing history, um, you know, I, I know I know you've made thousands, if not millions of pennies on, on your books. Um, you know. Like, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of looking at the crowd. Now, there are, there are a few people here who I know, like you are a photographer, you make things, you are excited about making things. And I, I've been teaching long enough that like, I feel like one of the most important things I can ever do for anyone is just be honest and like cut through bullshit and, and like have very real conversations about the realities of whatever, right? Hey, should we um, just quickly shift away, stop screen sharing maybe? Yeah, you bet. Okay. Um, so let's, you, should we talk about money? Yeah, let's talk about money. I, okay, so I, cause I, I love this. When we talk about books, there's always this idea that like the book as the sort of end game, right? And this book is like the, this, I don't know, success to a certain extent. Um, okay, I'm just gonna go back through the books that George has talked about that I've made over the years. Now this book was published in a sort of weird, already on-demand format where um, Publication Studio, who put this book out at the time, they basically had a um, sort of a series of photocopiers and glue binders set up in a storefront in downtown Portland. And people could go in and order art books from a sandwich board on the wow. wall wow. and pay something like, I wanna say it was maybe 30 bucks to buy this book at the time, right? And the, the money part of things, I believe there was some sort of split. I don't think I ever signed anything the person involved was a friend of mine. And I was just like, yeah, okay, let's do that. I made $0 from this book. However, I also spent $0 to make this book other than you know a few prototypes along the way. Uh, at one point, the publisher said, oh, hey, I owe you some money. And that was like 12 years ago. And, <laughs> still and you never, you're still waiting. Yeah, exactly. Now, um, oh, we forgot this one. So. This is a book, it's called From the Bottom of a Well. Uh, put this out with A Jump Books in 2011, I think it was. Um, in Syracuse, a Jump, right. What's that? They're in Syracuse. Uh, they used to be based in Ithaca, Ithaca, but they have since moved to Eugene. They're out here now. Okay. Um, now, A Jump is basically Ron Jude and his wife, Danielle Miracle, and they're good friends of mine, which, which matters because you know, the, their, their model at the time was, we'll each go in half, we'll cover the cost of production, and then all the books will sell, we'll split that in half, okay? When all was said and done, I think we each coughed up $2,400, okay? So a total cost of 4800 Now, after a year or so, I think Ron said, hey, I owe you about 1200 bucks. And I, because they were my friends, felt bad that my friends were gonna lose $1,200 to have published my book and said, don't worry about it. You know, let's just call it good. So this one cost me, you know, 2,400 bucks to make this book. Um, but it was, it was a legitimate first foray into publishing, you know, like this was printed in Iceland. 
dealt, I, I had to deal with other people. I didn't have total control. We had some back and forth in terms of editing, et cetera. Um, if anyone is interested in this book, I probably still have at least a hundred copies just floating <laughs> around here in this room. Um, it's a good one. I've, I've got it. And, and it's, and it was a book that I got and, and was like super psyched because when I first met you, Sean, and, and, you know, I, and I saw some of the early pictures from Hero, I'm like, this is, this is a, a person whose work is just bound, literally bound to end up in books. And oh, when, thank you. when From the Bottom of a Well came out, I was like, oh, yes, yes, it's, it's well, coming I, to view. This, this book was so fun because ultimately, like, <laughs> by the way, the, the context of this book is all of these pictures were made over the course of 16 days when I, as an American, went to China with five or six other American photographers to make propaganda for the Chinese government. Now, when I say propaganda, they paid for our trip and we were told that we could keep whatever, like we could photograph whatever we wanted, but at the end of the trip, we had to give them 10 pictures to use for promotional purposes to promote mm. whatever they wanted to promote. They, they sort of, they, they made it sound like they're going to be used for tourist sort of purposes, right? So a two week paid trip to go to China and do whatever I wanted. Well, that was great. But what I didn't know at the time until I got there was that the locations were going to be all sort of I would call them greenwashing locations, you know, like mm -hmm. let's go to a, a meadow that is, has been made over a garbage dump, you know, nice. let's go to a museum dedicated to the harmony of oil and wetlands. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like it was bullshit. And so once, once I slash we the Americans sort of became aware of that, there was like this two day window where everyone was like bitter. You know, we all felt like we'd been a little duped. Mm -hmm. And then I stopped and thought about it. It's like, man, I couldn't be luckier. I'm on an all expenses paid trip to make propaganda for the Chinese government. How cool <laughs> is that? You know, and I can still do what I can do, you know. So in a sense, this book is very much like a direct sort of attempt to push back at that. Right. So didn't, wasn't there a royalty check that showed up? years later no, well it wasn't for that one so oh. so at this point two books down i've lost zero dollars made it zero dollars i have spent twenty four hundred dollars um now blue sky in 2014 blue sky turned 40 and did this great thing where they invited a bunch of alumni photographers and you're in there aren't you yeah I'm and ken Collins included um, and they basically invited us all to make a book for their 40th anniversary. Now, this is work that I had shown there in 2003 Four. or four, something like that. Um, so it was all older work for the most part, although I did add a few new pictures at the end. But the funny thing about this is that this model, because this is an on-demand model, it was published through MagCloud, which is now owned by Blurb, you know, like any, any of you can just go to the blurb website and make something like this right now. But when all is said and done, they sell the books and then they cut a check at the end of the year. And so after this book came out at the end of that year, I got a check from the Oregon Center for Photographic Arts for $8. And the thing that's great about that $8 is that is the most money I had made from books in the previous <laughs> you know, decade. <laughs> And it was only the the only profits came through in the first year. There haven't I haven't asked. I, you know, I mean, maybe if I buy some more this year, we'll test it. Oh, if you, if you buy some more of your own book. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, like, you know, this is one that I like to have a few around for the family. So maybe I'll buy three or four copies, and we'll see what happens at the end of the year. Uh, uh, for those. The, 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 for oh, those who ahead, don't Jordan. know, just, I mean, there are a lot of Portland people on the, on the Zoom, but for those who don't know, Blue Sky Gallery is, is a, a, a classic nonprofit center for photography. Well, maybe it's not a nonprofit. Well, maybe it is. Um, it located, is located in Portland and Chris Rauschenberg is, is one of the geniuses behind it. 
anyway, and it's and it's a program of the Oregon Center for what is it called again? The Oregon Oregon Center for Photographic Arts is the sort of umbrella. Right. Over it. Right. Um, right. And then, so the, the the most recent one here that we're just looking at here, like when all is said and done, this book cost me five thousand um, dollars out of my pocket, but I got a grant to cover half of that um, part through the Oregon uh, Arts Commission and the Ford Family Foundation. So I can't complain. And and once you know, I haven't gotten anything back yet, but the agreement is that basically. Um, the publisher and I split the costs that come back. So, you know, fingers crossed, mm -hmm. I might be out of this book and have not lost anything. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> um, Josh Dupuy, I, I hope that you can, that Josh would take himself off of uh, mute because he's had some great comments. Maybe he can, he can ring in live here. Oh, Josh, you got to yeah. watch Josh. So Josh is a former student of mine, and I don't want to embarrass him in front of the room, but, but Josh is one of those people who sits there at the computer and has computer problems and just curses up a blue streak nonstop. <laughs> Josh, we need to meet you. Come into, come into real time here. No, maybe not. He's, he's, he's shy, right? No. <laughs> we all are in certain contexts yeah um well Anne, it would be nice to nice to hear from you let's let's check in with ann kendallin ann are you there i'm i'm here can you hear me yes okay um i'm good do you have a specific question and oh thank you thank you both this has been very enjoyable well, I, I, you, you've known Sean for a good long while. Um, is there anything that that we've missed that we ought to know? Are you looking for good stories? <laughs> oh well, sure. Do you have one or two or eight? Well, as you can tell, Sean's got a great sense of humor, and um, there was a period of time where he took over the role of secretary at Blue Sky Exhibition Meetings which resulted in the minutes always having a recipe added at the end. I don't know how that started, but it was hilarious. He just wanted to enter and that into the record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what were the recipes, Anne? What were they for? Oh, all kinds of different foods. I mean, it was, it was a real variety. And, and actually his way of taking minutes was, it should have been another book, Sean, that you could publish, ah. except I know we, <laughs> That's um, yeah, that was it was that was a great period. I enjoyed working together at that time. Mm -hmm. So what other stories? Boy, um, I think you covered a lot talking about each of the different books and, and the shows there. Well, the two of you now, both for a while, the, you were also. I was going to say the two of you both worked on the Portland um, uh, grid project which was kind of a that's, that's fascinating, correct. yeah, a mapping of the city. Have you gone back, in? I have not, have you? No, but I think about it all the time. So, so those of you who don't know what this is, um, Chris Rauschenberg in 1994, is that when it starts? Uh, 1996, I think, 95 or 96. Uh, Chris Rauschenberg gets this idea that he has spent the majority of his adult life photographing other places and decides that he should pay attention to Portland, the city that he's lived in, you know, actually has been his home base. And so he calls together Anne and a bunch of other friends of his at the time, and they randomly select a grid each month from the AAA roadmap. If I remember correctly, it was the 1994 AAA roadmap that mattered, like that map, right? That map would be at every meeting. They'd randomly select this grid. And the only rules were just both feet had to be on the ground in that one, grid. One foot, one foot. Oh, it was just one <laughs> foot. OK, lucky you. It was just one foot, right? right? Um, and it's, it's, it's so funny that this is happening serendipitously because, Anne, you, may, you probably don't even know this. I have, since 2003, 
you know, I teach a lot of intro level classes. And one of the assignments I give my students is this assignment where they have to like roll dice and randomly find a location out in the world, right? Like the idea is to get them lost so they don't know what they're gonna be looking for. And when I go through examples of uh, strategies to make your photographs effective, for example, you know, creating relationships, there is a picture of Ann Candelis that I use every time. And it oh. is a photograph of a parking lot and there's a puddle on the ground and there are some ripples in the puddle on one side of the frame and there are some lines from parking you know the parking lot on the other side of the frame so there's this great sort of left right relationship and we talk about vantage point and how the vantage point of the camera is sort of looking down low so the viewer doesn't have an escape they can't they can't get distracted and think the photograph is about anything other than this beautiful little serendipitous relationship. And I point out that there's no way in hell Ann Candelin left her house that day trying to go make kick-ass puddle <laughs> pictures, you know? That she was just open to seeing. Well, uh, Portland's a little bit rainy, isn't it? So you might have been able to count on some puddles. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so I think, there's, I think there was a little bit of pre-visualization uh, pre going on there. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, but that, that's a great point. I mean, that whole project, you sometimes you'd go to an area and you'd look around Forest Park, for example, <laughs> what am I going to find that's, you know, it was it was a great exercise, a great visual exercise. Well, and so one of the things that I feel like I, I learned from that project that is completely relevant to, you know, this book and uh, Hero it, is that I feel like one of the healthiest things I ever did was quit caring so much about what I'm going to do and adopt a stance of just photographing all the time, anywhere, everywhere over the course of my life. Quit letting a thesis statement guide my shooting and just make pictures. And then in hindsight, go back and sort of find a thread that can connect those pictures. Well, someone someone needs to someone needs to speak up here. I don't want to pick on people. Um, and I appreciate your being a being a good sport and letting me pick on you. <laughs> I was going to say you did just pick on me, but that's yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a pleasure to see you. Um, yeah, good to see you. Uh, who all is out there? Hello, hello. Hey, Dodd, Dodd, you were you were sitting around early. Have you uh, come up with any questions since we uh, since we have been pal palavering on here for a while, bantering on? Uh, uh, Sean, hi, uh, Dodd Demas. Uh, it, my name doesn't show up on my iPhone here. I'm from Minnesota. I know George uh, through Minnesota Connections and. Uh, George's dad gave my wife her first grown-up job a million years ago. <laughs> um, I think my, I know that story. Maybe I didn't. Go ahead. Uh, uh, it was MCAT mm -hmm. as an interim director. Um, now I forgot my question. <laughs> I, the, the, th the, the, the thing that strikes me, Sean, and one of, one of the things that often often frustrates me is quality of reproduction in, in photo books yeah. and you're and you're not doing stuff that would suggest uh, you're being tortured by that very much <laughs> um, and, 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 I, <laughs> and I'm not and I'm not I don't I don't mean that to I don't mean that to, to, to sound like I'm, I've not, I have not seen physically seen any of your books. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I'm saying is I, how do you feel about that? I mean, the, the, your cameras are, are, and your film are reproducing stuff in a dramatically different way than what your books are. What and how, I, do, how does, how do you, how does that play? Well, I mean, I would say one of the best ways to avoid that problem is lowering the bar, God. 
like <laughs> quit caring so much and um you know like so so really like there comes a point where there's only so much you can do and so much you can control yeah. and i've been around color photography through you know like i i came up I, the sort of last generation in a sense of like solely darkroom right like i didn't mm -hmm. even switch to digital until I was teaching digital for three years before I owned a digital camera. And so, and so when you, when you like come up printing in a, in a color dark room, I look back at the prints I made then and it's like, Oh, that's a kind of a shitty print. You know, that's off yeah. the colors, not that good. I was learning. That's fine. Um, and so I think if you, if you accept a margin of error and hope for the best, now I have, I have learned my way, you know, along the way, and I've learned to sort of err on a safe side when it comes to calibration. But, but to your point, I mean, still, you know, look, every single morning I get up and somewhere between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. usually, I put a picture up on Instagram, right? Like that's a, a daily practice for me. And every single morning, that picture has come from more often than not my digital camera, my editing process here at this machine, and then ends up before I post it, gets transferred over to my phone. And I press the button from my phone. Yeah. And just like two days ago, I put something up and I pressed the button on my phone and it ate me for 12 minutes that it looked shitty. It was darker <laughs> than I thought, you know, like it didn't match up with what I thought was supposed to be there. But I also know enough to know no one notices, no one cares. And, you know, when all is said and done, all you're trying to do is avoid embarrassment. And there's a pretty big latitude for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's certainly true when you're dealing with electronic images that, are, that people are looking at on their telephones. But yeah. you're, you're talking about books. Yes. Right? I mean, and, and we're talking about books here. Um, I have, I have actually, uh, I'm, and I'm not going to say any names, but I have a couple of sets of photographs by really good photographers that I'm really frustrated with the books mm. because, because of the reproduction. Yeah. Well, and that's something where, like, I can tell you that in the case of Hero, before that book came out, I went through and probably did at least two, if not three passes with the color correction for every image in the book, making sure to look at it on a calibrated system over time. I, I try not to ever rely on myself for one pass. Like I don't trust myself. I don't trust sure. my Tuesday self on Wednesday. You know what I mean? Sure. So, so I come back and I go over it over time. And then I also don't trust myself. And so I would also then send it out I sent it at least like on Hero, for example, there's a, a good photographer and a graphic designer, Matthew Portway. And oddly enough, he's a guy who I kind of know through Blue Sky and Portland. And I ended up hiring him to sort of do the heavy design lift on this book, meaning I don't know InDesign, right? I'd laid it all out. So I hired him to do that. And I learned in the process that he literally lives one block away from me <laughs> and has for like 14 years. And, um, and he was my second set of eyes. And so yeah. even if I don't trust myself, at least I could trust a larger pool of people to know that it may not be perfect, but it's outside that realm of being embarrassed, you know? Sure. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Stuart, Stuart Clipper yeah. wants to say something about uh, Mr. Richard Benson. Stuart, why don't you unmute yourself and come on. Come on, Stuart. Okay. Um, yeah, I was friends with Chip Benson, Richard Benson, and we were in an exhibition together about five years ago that Peter Galassi did for a museum in Sweden. And it was like I think he may have still been alive, but as far as his ideals of how photographs could best be reproduced, because he was, a, he was at the apex. I mean, he was at the spearhead of the finest, most elegant, most uh, yeah, eloquent way to reproduce photographs. And he went, 
you know, through many phases in his life, but it's almost like he left the material realm because his work in this exhibition was on a screen. He, mm -hmm. he was a, right. a he was a, a, a genius in, in several ways, and it wouldn't be any screen. It would be a screen that Richard Benson had formulated for his own personal needs. So yeah. I mean, you can get you can extrapolate quality and acceptance and tolerance, I guess. Right. And in 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 defense of in defense of Sean, I would say that that the books are well worth looking at. I mean that that to you know that there there are skills in the reproduction that are not necessarily evident in in um, screen versions. Well, and and so one of the things that like I mean, still one of the true pleasures of photo books and, and a possibility that exists in a photo book that just doesn't exist on a screen is a blank page, right? Like as you are flipping through a sequence and, and the, the, the potential of pausing. Now we can mm -hmm. sort of fake it on screens, but it's not the same. And the cadence not... isn't the same. The, 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 the speed is all wrong and clunky, you know? And so mm -hmm. that just, that act of physically turning that page and moving from one to the next is yeah, it's a performance. So it's choreography. Nicholas yeah. Gaffney has his hands up, and uh, uh, I'll turn him on or ask him to turn himself on. Didn't Nick, it's so good on. to finally Hi. meet you. It's, it's nice to meet you as well, Sean. Um, I, I really appreciate your talking, everything you're saying about books. And um, I, I do own a physical copy of Hero, and it's a Ooh. wonderful book, and you should be very proud of it. Thank it's you. really great. Um, I think I got to know you. I'm not 100% sure about this, but it might have been via Instagram initially because I um, started following you on Instagram. And I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you, because you, you mentioned this earlier that every morning you wake, you, you get up and you post a picture to Instagram. Kind of how you feel about that practice and how you feel about, I mean, I guess Instagram is, is the most obvious thing. There's other kind of ways to share photos on the internet, but, and how do you, how you feel about that? How you feel about the work you're posting there, which is, is really good, but, but I don't know how you personally feel about it. And I, I think, you know, that I post photos fairly regularly to Instagram as well. And to a certain extent, I hate it, but a certain extent I like it because it's, it's, it's sort of like going, not, not exactly going to the gym, but it's like there's there's a certain kind of exercise that is like, okay, I'm going to put something there. I'm not sure if it's going to be the greatest thing in the world, but I'm going to try something and, and see what happens. I don't know if you can yeah. talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, Sean, yeah. Before, before you answer, let me just interject um, that it is now a little bit past the hour um, and right. you know, that, I, that I typically like to you know, I'm happy to go run run a little bit long, um, but I do want to thank the people who have been here and who have to head off. So um, next next month is Stella Johnson um, and Lori Grinker in November and Stuart Rome in December. So upcoming right, yeah. upcoming banters. And thank you for showing up. Like I get it if you need to cut out. Yep. Yep. Um, so but go you, ahead with yeah. the Instagram. Yeah. So to your question, Nick, like, so I didn't, like, I was not an early adopter of Instagram. I hated it. I hated all forms of social media. Um, I had, you know, like I was on Facebook when everyone else got on Facebook and I was so, I was so put off by the fact that all of a sudden, like, I felt like I'd lived my entire life carefully separating people you know, like my family's over here and my photo people are here and my work people are here. And God, all of a sudden on Facebook, they're all together. That sucks. <laughs> I didn't like that party at all. And, and so um, Instagram was like this sort of gross extension of that, but then involved the one thing that I really cared about. Like, you know, I, like photography is something I really care about. I love it. I love the process, even still 20 years after I've been doing it, you know. Um, and so I just didn't do it. And then what I realized is that it wasn't doing me any good to not do it. You know, it was simply that this conversation was taking place and I just wasn't there, you know, like there's a bunch of people, yourself included, 
who are like, I, I say yourself, I mean, shit, I see at least eight of you here on the screen, right? Um, there are a bunch of people whose work I admire and respect, and this conversation is happening. So maybe I should go ahead and go stand in the kitchen with everyone else and have the conversation. And so I sort of reluctantly came into it pretty late, but the way, and then I also have realized that, you know, people use it in different ways. I am, <laughs> I am comfortable enough with failure that I just put photos up there every single day. You know, I know some of them, like I, I know the minute I press a button, like that one's gonna flop. I'm gonna be lucky if 20 people like that photo. But to my mind, it's still just the process. It's the it's learning your image, process. It's your image of the day. I mean, it's, exactly. Yeah. You know, every day is not going to be brilliant. Um, exactly. Some but days that are said, be beautiful. I, but I'm also a fragile enough human being that I knew that I was doing this talk today. And I posted a photo this morning that I knew was going to kill it. And how, did, like, how, did, it, how did it go? I did. I, I haven't checked since like noon, but it was kicking ass at noon. You know, like it, it was I intentionally put a photo up that I knew was going to be a little boost rather than a nagging doubt. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I use like Instagram is both fun and it, Josh says 144, by the way, I'm at 144. Nice. So, you nice. know, that's all right. Um, <laughs> Now, Matthew, Matthew Brown's comment, oh, dude, just saw the picture, so sick. Now, is that- I, I'm Nice sorry. brownie slice. Yeah, I know you, Matthew. Thank oh, you for being here. Great to Maddie, meet you. That's Matty Ice brownie slice? Yeah. Great. There we go. All right, um, connections being made. Yeah, exactly. See, and it, see, that's the thing, is that like, when all is said and done, because I, I worked with Photolucida for a number of years, and what I learned from that is that the world is so small. It's not like there are, frankly, there aren't even really hundreds of photo community people out there actively engaged. There are hundreds who are kind of doing a little bit, but um, the world's just too damn small. And so Instagram gives me a way to both, like I come away from Instagram every morning feeling um, a little bit jealous because I always see something, you know, there's always a picture or two or 18 where I'm like, oh shit, that's really nice. Mm. You know? um, yeah. Josh, uh, Josh, I wanted Josh's comment about uh, Instagram officially stating that they are moving away from being a photo sharing site. Uh, that's something that I hadn't heard about. Um, and Josh, I would love to know more. I mean, offline, perhaps you can send me a message because Instagram has been a pretty important part of my life over the last couple of years. Um, yeah, so, sorry, I was kind of doing two things at once a little while back. Uh, it, they, they've just, they've seen the success of TikTok. I don't know how many of you know about TikTok. I'm sure you've heard of it. Mm -hmm. And it's it's all about sharing videos. And yeah, it's just kind of, it's 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 just the nature of the internet, and they're seeing that's where the money is at. That's that's where the money is at is is being a platform that shares video. So uh, that's that. So that's I mean, you're still going to be able to share photos. Uh, I I believe, but uh, they no longer consider themselves. Uh, you know, to be a photo sharing site, but they're going to be putting their 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 money and their power into uh, boosting the video. So, mm. uh, so yeah, I I would just put it out there. You know, I, I, it it just kind of is what it is. Yeah. Well, we'll pay attention for sure, um, because the Instagram really has become so such a valuable tool and i think it's both communications of personal interests and a certain level of marketing but also right. self-revelation um you know I, I i use it in ways that you know are, are pretty emotionally satisfying but also very uh you know very searching and i really am looking for feedback 
uh, and have, have received a, a lot of, you know, I mean, Instagram, frankly, carried me through COVID. Huh. It, yeah. helped, it helped me st feel connected and stay, you know, positive as I was photographing my father. And, um, you know, I, I, I think a lot of Instagram and I, you know, had to convince people that, in fact, it does matter. It's interesting that you mentioned that during COVID, because especially during COVID, you know, like, mm -hmm. it's not like you're meeting anyone for coffee. Right, exactly. Exactly. We were meeting on Instagram. Um, Sean, it, I mean, I, I know that we could continue on for at least another 10 minutes, but um, <laughs> maybe another 10 hours. Um, but I want to thank you so much for spending the time this evening. Uh, it was great to see you. Oh, thank you and everyone here. I mean, you know, like the, the frankly, the sad thing is simply that we can't just like walk over to a bar right now. You know, that's that's the <laughs> oh, dream. That's right. It's 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 beer time in Portland now, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We started happy started right with now. coffee and, and now we're going to graduate to something a little stronger. Yeah. All right. Well, Sean, you. you were you were promising beers to people who got your book. It's true. <laughs> I forgot. You know what? I'm, I'm going to make good on that promise. You know, as soon as feel safe. Yeah, absolutely. Right. 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 That was one of that was one of the uh, subscription perks, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you anyone who buys my book, I will buy you a beer. All right. If that goes. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll have to get you out to Minnesota to fulfill that promise at some point. Yep, um, we'll do. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for, for being here. I'm going to, oh, there are six new messages. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. That's perfect. Um, all right. Um, there will be a recording of, of this and there will be excerpts from this that will be available on georgeslade.photo um, and on YouTube uh, within the next couple of weeks. So thank you again, everyone. Um, please consider donating to Venmo, Venmo me at George dash slade dash two um and we'll see everyone hopefully uh uh for stella's talk on october 18th all right that's all, right. all thank, for you. Now. thank you bye everyone thanks, George. thanks sean okay bye, thanks. thank you thanks again that was great bye. thanks okay awesome.